All right, before we dive into this episode, The Minimalists want to help you declutter your glowing screen. So head on over to theminimalists.com slash wallpapers to download any of our free minimalist wallpapers, including our Love People Use Things wallpaper for your smartphone or computer. Enjoy. The Minimalists. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And my name is Ryan Nicodemus, and together we are the Minimalists. Today, we're going to talk about career advice. We're going to talk about pursuing your passions. We're going to talk about mentors. We're going to talk about stepping stones, the stepping stones to success. And we're going to talk about a whole lot more with Ken Coleman. He's our guest today. He's the author of The Proximity Principle, yeah. which I'll hold up if you're watching this on YouTube. You can check that out. Ken, thank you for joining us today. Josh, Ryan. We I'm are thrilled. happy to have you, man. Like, I, I'm stoked about this. This awesome. is going to be fun. So so the folks who listen to this know we're we are giant fans of the, the whole Ramsey team. And mm. this is the only Ramsey personality who has not been on our show, I think. <laughs> And, and some people I don't know what to make of that. They've laughed you a couple times. Yeah, like Rachel's <laughs> been on twice, and Anthony's going to be on yeah, again. Yeah, I got to step Chris up my game. Twice. <laughs> <laughs> I got to step it up here. This the pressure's on. Uh, so. <laughs> this is going to be great. Now, before so we we're going to dive into some listener questions here. I really I wanted to real quick talk about your book, The Proximity Principle, because uh, Ryan and I often have this line. We talk about proximity is actually a problem in in many respects, but you address the problem with proximity. You're fighting fire with fire in a way. So what I often say is most of our relationships in our life are birthed out of convenience and proximity. Yes. And, and so we hang out with people who happen to work in the cubicle next to us, or we grew up in the same neighborhood together, but we don't share the same values, beliefs, interests, desires, goals, objectives in life. And so, you know, there, there's obviously the saying of, you. The, the, who was it? Was it... Um, was it Zig Ziglar or, or someone like that? Who and I know you actually talk about it in your book. That you are the the Jim Rohn. Jim Rohn. It was the Jim average Rohn. of the five people you spend the most time with. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and so um, right now we're, we we have access to more more people than ever, but we're stuck in proximity to the the sort of people around us. And in the book, you talk about well, you talk about proximity being proximity to people, proximity to place, and then you also talk about a very important step. There's also a lot of hard work involved. Yes, yeah. And so can we, can we sort of talk real quick about uh, you delineate in the book between environmental peers versus mm. intentional peers? Yes. Well, I'm so glad you brought this up because the, the scene that you set for us all is absolutely spot on. And what's missing in the scene that you pay, painted for us is intentionality. Because it, the, what I mean by environmental peers are these are the people that you are just by your natural, just this is where you are in life, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, this is what you inherit, right? So right. these are the peers, so we're talking about family and friends, mm. that are around you by just the nature of your current station. So that's yeah. environmental. So as you said, we grow up with them, we go to school with them, we see them over the summertime, whatever that is. But And then when we look at the... Uh, uh, intentional peers this is where we decide hey these are the people that i'm choosing to be around right okay yeah. now what's interesting is there's a choice you know in in just staying with the environment that you're in yeah okay well this this is just and most people do this why it's the easy thing to do well it's even deeper than that what's that it's safe yeah yeah it's so comfortable it, yeah. it is it's so certainty so, yeah and so there it is yeah. so because it is safe and it's certain right mm. because uncertainty is our greatest fear yeah i'm telling you right now you go look it up i'm not the only person to say this the unknown is the greatest fear that humans face mm -hmm. greatest fear now so in my environment it's safe because it's certain and then it makes it easy right but mm. for me to change uh-oh, now mm -hmm. things get to be difficult just by virtue of facing the emotion of choosing to be around different people. Let's talk about what that looks like. Well, if you choose to stop hanging out with people that you've been in relationship with, 
Well, now that hurts their feelings. Yeah. They get mad. They uh, start to question, why are you doing this? They poo-poo the choices that you're making. And there's tremendous pressure for you to not make the change that you know in your head and your heart yeah. that you need to make. And so the delineation there in the book is, okay, uh, this is environmental, and then here, this is intentional here. And so we've got to make the intentional choices to be around the people that are going to lift us, push us and hold us accountable. We talk about that, the actual, that's one of the five people in the book is the peer. So yeah. uh, that's the difference. And some of us are blessed to have environmental peers that need to stay in our lives. Right. I, now that's my particular journey, mm. but there are some that I had to leave behind. Yeah. And that's painful for both parties, by the way. Absolutely. But at the end of the day, you got one life and it's your life to live, not the life that they want you to live. Yeah, and I think what happens is we often end up getting dragged in other people's directions if uh, if we allow that to happen. No question. Yeah, think about it. We're all spinning around each other, right? And so you're hanging around the wrong people. They pull you into their orb, mm-hmm. and and so now you're just kind of rotating. That's what that's what uh, uh, Roan is talking about. Let me give you some more data on this. Okay, Jim Rohn's right, but how about the most uh, storied, the most impressive, historic. Uh, uh, relationship study in history by the University of Harvard. I mean, Harvard, Harvard University. It's over 80 years old. Okay, and they keep iterating on this study on the power of relationships in our lives. Mm. And one of the leading sociologists in that study at Harvard has said, not his name escapes me right now, but he has said that 95 percent of our success or failure is predicated on the people we hang around with. That is it. mind-boggling. Yeah. Yeah, I, we we often like to take full credit for everything that we do, and of course, <laughs> blame everyone else for for any of any of the failures. But ultimately, what you're saying is, it's up to me to surround myself with with the people who are going to empower me, mm. the people who are going to inspire me or motivate me. It, it's it's up to me to to find those those intentional peers as opposed to being dragged in the direction of of the environmental peers no around yeah. we got some questions here today our first question is from melissa in delaware hi guys my name's melissa i'm from milford delaware and my question pertains to passion and finding a, a job to pay the bills and i am passionate about the current job i have um, however some of their daily tasks don't really line up with my values related to the field and I don't feel inspired anymore by the job, and I feel very bored when I go there, and I nobody's teaching me anything anymore. So I would like some advice on how to find another job that can pay the bills, even though you're not inspired by the current one you're in. However, the current one you're in is providing you with the highest pay at the time. So I'm just looking to continue doing my passion and stay inspired as well as pay the bills. And I can't really find a balance to do both. All right. So Ken, you, you address this a lot uh, on your radio show, the Ken Coleman show. It's appropriately named. Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Highly creative. I want to point that out. We spent days and days coming up with that name. Focus groups. Yeah. <laughs> And so I, I, I think can, you're, you're best equipped to, to answer this question because Melissa is in a situation right now where she's, she has a job to pay the bills. And as Dave Ramsey writes in the foreword to your book, that's a blessing uh, that you have the ability to pay your bills. But it doesn't mean you have to stay there forever necessarily. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. As she started out the call, Melissa said, uh, I'm passionate about the work. But then she kept delineating and it sounded as though she was a passionate. So I want to point out to the rest of the listeners here what you really should be hearing in what she said. What she said was, I'm bored. Mm. That's what she said. Yeah. She said, I'm not learning anything. And she also pointed out, I have a problem with the, the some of the things they do. There's no value in it. Now, at first, as I heard that, I said, well, is this a, is this a uh, value conviction issue? It's not. What you're hearing Melissa say is, I'm not challenged anymore. I'm not learning. When she says I'm not learning anything, this is one of the five causes of buildup on the heart. Okay. I don't believe that burnout's a thing. 
Now, burnout has been named very recently by the World Health Organization as a medical condition. I think that's a bunch of hooey mm. because it's not a medical condition. Are some of the things that result in the way you're feeling, do they cause medical things? Yes. But we can't treat buildup on the heart with a pill. Right. Okay. Now, so what I would tell Melissa is, okay, good news you know the work that you really enjoy doing. She says that right in the first 10 seconds of the call. So now we want to identify other opportunities. So this is going to be outside of her organization. She has hit her lid. I don't think that there is a ladder for her in her current organization. So that is one of the first clear signs that it's time to start looking outward. So what is she looking for? She's looking for something that will be uh, very similar to the work that she has been doing, but it comes with greater challenges. Mm. New challenges is the first thing she's looking for. The second thing she's looking for is a organization that presents a ladder to her. And what I mean by that is they are known for two key things. Number one, they develop their people. Mm. And as a result of developing their people, they promote their people. That's what she needs to look for. And by the way, it's out there. Yeah. So this is not a new career necessarily. It's not a complete direction change. It's just looking at, okay, what do I do best? And she knows what she does best. She's a rock star. That's why she's outgrown her current position. Mm -hmm. And her leaders are poor leaders. They haven't noticed that this is a woman who needs a challenge, who has mastered her position, and she needs more. So she wants to make sure that she is very clear on this is what I do best. These are my talents, strengths, and skills. And then she goes, okay, I loved this work two years ago or a year ago. Right. And so what are the elements in the day that I love that gives me the juice, as I like to say? Mm. And when she can identify those two things, she's retreating to clarity, which I talk about the sweet spot. You use what you do best to do what you love to do most. Mm. She gets that clarity and now she knows what she's looking for. And she goes and looks for it. She does not leave this job right. until the other job's ready to go. And then she says, hey, love you all. Appreciate you. Mm -hmm. It's time for me to move on. I was thinking about too, like if she's really good at what she does, if, if she is a rock star for her company, she can you know get clear on you know how that perfect job looks. She can go to her boss and she could even maybe suggest like, hey, I know that what I'm doing right now is X, Y, and Z. I would like to add in A, B, or C, and here's why. Here's the, here's the yes. additional value that I'm going to add to the company. So I totally agree. She doesn't have to totally leave her job right now. She can, uh, sh she can maybe manipulate a little bit what she's doing right now. I do wanna say, if, you know, if she's, you know, has to kill puppies every day. Yeah, leave the job. Like that's going against <laughs> right, your values. Right, right. But uh, but I agree with you. It doesn't sound like it was really going against your values yeah. as much as yeah. she is bored. And I think you know burnout. I, I agree. I think it's kind of hooey. Yeah. I think what happens though with with us humans, we our brains get uh, we get bored when we master something. That's right. And when we ma she is a master at her job right now. So our mind automatically wants to learn other things, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, she could. I, you know, to me, like I always go to giving, like I'll go to, if I start to feel bored or, um, I start to feel like I'm not growing, like I go to a soup kitchen, I'll sign up for Habitat for Humanity. Um, I'll just walk down the street and buy homeless people meals, like just something to make me feel like I'm contributing, uh, beyond myself in a meaningful way. I love that. So I, I guess another, another, uh, suggestion for Melissa here is try to find something maybe outside of your job where you can contribute and you can feel like you are growing. You don't necessarily have to grow with your job per se. Um, you can grow in other areas of your life and that might fulfill the need. There's a lot of you know ideas and suggestions here. Melissa, it, try them all out and see, see what works best. Yeah. Can you, you in your book talk about mentors and it sounds mm -hmm. to me like she probably does, if she does have a mentor, she's outgrown the mentor in a way. Um, and can we, can we talk a little bit about that, about the need for having a mentor and when she's pursuing this new job, this new career, it sounds to me like she probably also needs to pursue the appropriate mentors. Yeah. Well, we all need mentors. So yeah. this is not just a Melissa thing. This is uh, an everybody thing. And here's why. In this moment of uncertainty, you know, and she's feeling, you can tell it, you could hear, there's some, there's some just natural anxiety built up there about what's next, where do I go, how do I go, all this kind of stuff. And having that mentor, somebody who um, is older, has more experience, has some knowledge, and has wisdom. And when you can sit down with them and go, okay, here's where I am, 
here's here's what's going on here's why it's feeling this way i feel like i want to go this direction not sure you're able to be totally vulnerable and transparent and then that mentor is able to very objectively process all that coming back and they're also known for at least knowing us well enough to where we know they care for us and they're going to give us some truth it's not going to always be what we want to hear but it's what we need to hear and in this situation it's wonderful to have a sounding board sometimes just to give us perspective that it's not as bad as we think Mm -hmm. Uh, in my journey there were many times where i felt like i wasn't going to be able to hang on there was tremendous doubt because i was going into broadcasting it's a very difficult world to make it in very 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 difficult uh very political uh it's just tough especially with the changing landscape which a lot of people are finding in all of their careers now the landscapes are are shifting really rapidly yeah and there were times where i almost quit And it was a call to a mentor in Houston, Texas, another mentor in Seattle, Washington. Those two men multiple times kept me in the game by simply being there, hearing me kind of vetch a little bit and kind of complain and talk about how down I was and just didn't see it and blah, 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 you know, human Eeyore. And uh, (laughs) they were my tiggers. And they were Mm -hmm. like, six months ago, you would have chewed your right leg off to be where you are now. Yeah, You've had some good things happen. It's yeah. not happening the way you wanted to or as fast as you wanted to, but you got to stay with it. You're not delusional. You're yeah. going to make it, but you got to stay. That was a game changer for me. That's great. Melissa, yeah, well, I'm gonna, well, I want to well, add one more thing. So Melissa talks about the money factor and how if she could jump to a different job, that'd be great. But well, what she's doing right now is it's paying the bills and she's making a certain amount of money. This is where minimalism comes in. I mean, when we when I got laid off, when Josh quit, uh, what did we make like twenty three thousand bucks that year? Yeah. And if I if I hadn't simplified my life and prepared for that that leap, then yeah, I would be in a world of hurt. So I, I guess just anyone out there who has that particular problem where they're scared to make less money, uh, you can totally find ways. Oh, it takes a plan. It's not like you can just turn on a switch and tomorrow, boom, I can make $10,000 less a year. But you can make a plan, pay off debt, save some money, get you know six months worth of savings to the point where you could make this leap and maybe make a little bit less for that first year just so you can have that perfect job. Because Melissa, if there's a job sitting right now that she's looking at, she's like, God, I would be so thrilled to do this job and it's really, really what I want, but the money's not there. That is that is a hurdle that you can absolutely get over. It's, right. it's not easy, but uh, you absolutely can get over that well, hurdle. Well, and let, let me just add real quick to it. Don't yeah. assume that there's not something out there that pays the same or more. Absolutely. Now, so let's go do our homework. Let's go do some research. Don't just assume. That's one of the things people do a lot. Mm-hmm. And I, I just, I got to tell you, don't, you know, just because it's safety, it's 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 like, uh, even though she may not be making millions of dollars, this is still the idea of the golden handcuffs. You know, mm-hmm. we're, we're so scared to just even look for heaven's sakes. We didn't say leave. We said, look, right. The phrase says, look before you leap. Mm -hmm. And I also want to say a big, big, big amen to what you just said on minimalism. This idea that you're not going to have to give up something to move up is insane. Mm -hmm. There will be times in your life, many times that you will have to give up to move up. Yeah. So in this situation, it might be, I'm going to have to give up some of my luxuries, which means I'm going to cut, 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 cut cut Mm. and change my lifestyle to change my future i love that sean you can tweet that sometimes you have to give up to move up that's great man one other thing you can tweet this is a quote from his book it's uh no one is sitting around thinking about how they can help you find your dream job. And so that's not that's not just for Melissa. Yeah, that's for anyone yeah. to think about. You, you, we, we often get stuck on our heads and we think that, well, everyone's thinking about me and how they can help me mm-hmm. succeed. But the truth is they're not. Melissa, I'm going to send you a copy of The Proximity Principle. I think you will really enjoy it. I got a lot out of it. This is really the book I wish I could have given to my 18-year-old self or my 24-year-old self. Um, oh, I'm going to give it to some friends and family. Right. I, got, I have one family member who I was talking about, here's kind of the steps you need to take. And they literally said, unless someone hands me the perfect job, I'm just going to stay where I'm at. Oh, well, <laughs> just going to stay where you're wow. at. Yeah, Hope and like, you enjoy sitting still for right. a long time. <laughs> Melissa, I'm also going to send you a copy of our book, Minimalism, Live a Meaningful Life. It's the first book that Ryan and I wrote, but there is an entire chapter in there about passion and, and how you shouldn't confuse excitement 
with passion. Right now, I know you're dealing with some boredom issues, and I think uh, that passion chapter will will help illuminate the path forward for you. So if you like our podcast, you'll like the audiobook version of Minimalism, Live a Meaningful Life, or if you want the book book or the ebook, we're happy to send those to you as well. Ryan, what time is it? You know what time it is. It is time for our lightning round, where we answer questions from social media. Indeed, we do. We are at The Minimalists on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We have at Ken Coleman here as well. Yes. You can Thank reach you. out to him on, on Twitter, follow him. And uh, so what we try to do here, Ken, is we try to answer questions in short, shareable, less than 140 character responses, Ooh, but not like really. That. We just ramble on That's a bit. That's a nice challenge, and, though. And then what happens is is uh, Podcast Sean tweezes them out, the, the beautiful, <laughs> pithy remarks out, and we call them minimal maxims, and we catalog all of our minimal maxims over at uh, minimalmaxims.com. Ryan, what's our first question? Our first question is from Caitlin. How do you make your dream job come true when you have too much competition to compete with in that field. Josh, could you imagine if we let that stop us from creating our, our website? I mean, how many how many minimalism blogs were there? Yeah, I mean, thousands, and that that's the thing. <laughs> and it, think about with uh, with Dave Ramsey. He's not the first person to ever give financial advice. Um, <laughs> or think about this book. So, so uh, Seth Godin wrote about this recently. So if uh, you're selling the proximity principle, where do you want to sell it? You you probably want to sell it at a bookstore and not at the 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 Exxon Mobil gas station on the corner. Well, but there's no competition. There's no competition at all at the Exxon Mobil gas station, but you're more likely to sell this book at a bookstore where mm. there is competition. Why is that? Well, because people show up. People show up at the bookstore. They've already made the decision I want to buy a book. Mm -hmm. The question now is, which book do I want to buy? Which one's going to add the most value to my life? And so I would argue that competition, especially friendly competition like that, I mean, there's a, there's such a thing as toxic competition for sure that can get in the way, but, but friendly competition is actually a good thing, Caitlin. So Ken, how does she make her, her, her dream job come true when there's so much competition in that field? There's only one you. Mm -hmm. And you were created to fill a unique role. That means that you were needed and you must do it. Somebody out there needs you to be you. Mm -hmm. Stop competing and start contributing. Mm, yes. That is pithy. Yes. Well, let me give you something Stop pithy Stop competing here. and start contributing. That's great. You man. know what I'm saying? Yeah, dude. Absolutely. Like the idea is her mindset needs to change. 100%. Don't compete against everybody else. Compete against yourself. Yeah. Be the best you. Yeah, that's yeah. actually my pithy answer is if you, wanna, if you want to grow, compete with the best version of yourself. So uh, I, I am I'm 38 years old now, uh, right now, and I am most inspired by my 45-year-old self. Like, I, because I want to be the best version of myself seven years from now, right? And, and I think uh, the same should be true for all of us. We should aspire to be the best version of ourselves. Yeah, my pithy answer is adding value begets value. And I got a little aside, the best way to add value is to contribute. So the thing is, is with Josh and I, when we started theminimalists.com, we didn't just copy what everyone else did. We added value in that field That's in right. a unique way. And anyone can do that. And you know, sometimes that doesn't mean like you have to have your own unique spin on it. You can just you can just go to a company and offer to get coffee for free and just find a way to contribute towards a company you wanna work for and there may be a thousand people applying. But if you can find one way to contribute that no one else is contributing, they're going to, they're going to notice that and they're going to appreciate that. That's right. You talk about internships in, in your book and we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but I think some people are allergic to this, this idea of like oh. taking a step back in order mm -hmm. to actually step in the right direction. Can we talk about internships? Yeah. Yeah. And I use that word loosely because some of your listeners are going, Ken, I'm 32, I'm 35, I'm 42, I'm 45. I'm not mm -hmm. going to intern. Well, uh, why not? Because mm -hmm. I was 32 and I interned uh, by simply showing up one day at the number one sports talk station in Atlanta. We're talking about a number eight market. So this is a big city, big opportunity. And I walked in off the street and asked to speak to the program director. He didn't know me from Adam's house cat. And the girl at the front desk thought I was nuts. But I, I went in and said, listen, uh, I knew his name and we had a mutual connection. So I dropped the mutual connections name and said, um, I'm out here and I just want two minutes of his time. Uh, and I'll literally put myself on a stopwatch. Yeah. And she relayed the <laughs> message to him and he showed up and he kind of looked at me like I had four ears, but I smiled big. I wasn't a nut job. I dropped the mutual connection. He told me to drop by. I just wanted two minutes. Don't even have to go back to the office. I just want to help out around here. 
I want to get into broadcasting. I'm successful. I have my own company. I'm not going to ask you for a nickel. Mm. But is there any way that I can just hang around and be of service, stay from underfoot, you know, but just help? What is the guy going to say to that? Right. He was like, okay, <laughs> but we did it. And so for three days a week, uh, for three hours a day, uh, I was in there screening phone calls, getting mm. Sprite for guys that were on the air that weren't even making as much as I was. Why do I tell that story? To illustrate what I'm writing about in the book, which is the idea of interning simply means showing up for free, volunteering your time to get in proximity. Why? Well, number one, you get to get in there and you're in the middle of the place that you think you want to end up being in. And mm. so what am I doing? I'm clarifying that yes, this is something I think I'd like to do. Mm -hmm. And that verifies the feeling in the heart. So we want to clarify in order to verify that we're not nuts, that we really are wanting to pursue this. This stirs our heart. The best place to do that is show up and work for free because it's really hard for people to say no to that. Yeah. And so it's just simple, simple strategy here that works. And that's what I'm talking about. And again, um, I've done it. Yeah. And and it is the way to get in, you know? And sometimes it's not even doing anything. Just say, hey, can I just shadow? Right. Well, mm. you say in, in the book, the the line that stood out to me is practice doesn't pay well. No, it doesn't. And, and But that's not the point of practice, right? right. It, you're not practicing so that it mm. pays you. You are practicing so that you are honing your skills. You're getting better. You're growing. You're learning so that you can use those skills in the future to contribute in a way that will ideally pay you. Yeah. I got a line here. I got to drop it. Yeah. You inspired me. <laughs> practice doesn't pay well, but it always ages well. <sighs> Yeah, what man. I mean by that is that is a great ROI. It mm -hmm. will return. It doesn't always return quickly. Right. But I'm telling you right now, I'm doing things on the on the air every day that I learned in those really humble moments of just watching other people and just kind of wishing I was at the party, but I wasn't at the party. I was mm -hmm. outside looking in and watching everybody party. But mm -hmm. sometimes being close enough to look in the window is all you need. Yeah, that experience is priceless. Yeah, I, yeah, I totally agree. MK wants to know, how do you ask someone to be a mentor? So we touched on, on mentorship uh, a little bit. My, my pithy answer is ask not what you can get, ask what you can give. Yeah. And, and I think that's, that's mm -hmm. the thing. We, when we show up somewhere, it is very much like, okay, um, here's what I need you to give to me. Well, it's like, I've never met you. Why would I do that? But you, when you showed up to the radio station, you said, how can I serve you? How can I be of service? And if you're asking that question, I think you're going you're gonna to end up with a better answer. Yeah. My answer on this is let's stop making the mentor this hard-to-reach soothsayer on the top of a very difficult mountain to climb. Mm. Okay, let's stop making it that. The yeah. Sherpa, I love the Sherpa. Everybody needs a Sherpa, but your Sherpa might be somebody that you've known for 30, 40 years. It's just a successful man or woman who in their own field, different field than your field, but they've just done life well and they've got wisdom. They have compassion for you. They're on your team. Uh, let's stop making this such a difficult person to find it's not. So it needs to be somebody that you already know or B, uh, you have a mutual relationship and they grease the wheels for you to where it is not this cold call. It's not this out of left field thing. Mm -hmm. And then here's how you approach them. This is so ridiculously simple, but it works nine times out of 10. And when it doesn't work, you know, that's not the right person anyway. So nine times out of 10, this works. Number one, you want to show, uh, tremendous humility by saying, Hey, you're where I would like to be. You're just, you're, you're, you're there and I admire you. And as a result, I would like to learn from you and I would be incredibly grateful. I don't want to eat up a lot of your time. I'll do it on your schedule whenever. And our time together is about me bringing uh, scenarios, learning best practices, uh, just learning things from you on where I need to go next, what you would recommend I do to continue to grow and hold me accountable to the things we talk about. That's what I'd like to happen. And I would be blown away and incredibly grateful if, if you would consider this. Now, let me tell you something. You approach people like that, they get value by feeling valuable. Mm -hmm. So people go, what? I have nothing to give. Garbage. Yes, you do. You can give the feeling of being valuable. And I don't care how successful you are. Everybody loves to give their opinion and everybody <laughs> loves to feel valuable. Yeah. So if you do that, nine times out of 10, 
They're going to say, yep. And I'm doing that right now with a guy that we had a mutual relationship, didn't know me at all. We had a mutual relationship. The mutual relationship sent a text to this guy. He's almost seven years old. He does life coaching and career coaching for seven figure earners. Okay. Mm. He's behind the scenes. Like you'd never know him. He's a freaking rock star. Okay. And he's forgotten more about coaching people than I know at this point. And I'm 45 and I've got a national program. And so I've got to make sure that I'm sharpening myself all the time, that I'm being filled up from somebody who's got way more than I do. And so I approached this guy that way. And he was like, Ken, I'd love to fit you in my schedule. He's a busy dude. He doesn't need this. Uh, but it's game changing right now for me. You wouldn't believe how it's filling me up and pushing me and challenging me. So I just want people to know that I've done what I'm preaching and it works. And people will say yes to that. Yeah, absolutely. But my pithy answer is contributing to a person's life is the best way to get their attention. So it's kind of similar to what we were talking about with Caitlin. I mean, if you're really, really trying to get someone's attention, you're sending them an email, they won't give you the two minutes, they're, you know, you're tweeting them, they're not tweeting you back, find a way to add value to that person's life. I was thinking about uh, Jess Williams when, when I was uh, thinking about this question. She does all of our social media for us. And she had reached out to me in an email years back, just something simple like, hey, you know, my husband and I were photographers. You guys are coming to Los Angeles. We would love to uh, take some pictures for your event. Would you be down for that? Like, yeah, absolutely. So she came out, took some great, uh, her and Matt took some great pictures, sent them to us. We, you know, became friends on Twitter. Uh, but then all of a sudden we had this need for a social media man manager. She's the first person to pop into my head because I know how she manages her own social media. I know her uh, photography skills. So I went to Josh. I'm like, dude, let's look at this Jess Williams gal. Like maybe she might be someone who could do this work for us. And actually when I think about it, podcast Sean, I mean, he was editing our stuff mm -hmm. when we first started. Mm-hmm. Uh, you think about Sean Mahalik, who doesn't do anything for us anymore, but well, he he manages the how to write better <clears throat> class with me. Okay, yeah. So so like all these people that we have a part of our circle with the minimalists dot com, it all started with them just uh, giving a little bit to us to 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 get our attention, basically. But I you know I get asked a lot, um, hey, can you do this for me? Can you do that for me? And it's like I would love to say yes to everybody, but I, no, I can't do that for you. I'm sorry. Right. The, the only thing I'll add to this is sometimes you can be both a mentee and a mentor to mm -hmm. someone. Ryan and I have a, a, a relationship like that where where our, you know, it's sort of yin and yang. So our, our strong suit for one person will be a weakness for the other. And, and so I, actually I have a, a, a friend as well, uh, Chris Kelly from Nourish Balance Thrive, who is very much a mentor uh, with a lot of health stuff for me. But um, I've been a mentor f for him with certain business aspects uh, that, that I've been able to help him out with. And, and so you can get and give. By the way, that's how every great relationship tends to work anyway. Yeah, yeah absolutely. All right, before we dive into our added value segment and our listener tips and tricks this week, it looks like we got a bunch more surprise questions today, including how can I figure out what I'm passionate about? Is it possible to change careers without going back to square one? What are the important things to keep in mind when freelancing? How can I pursue my dream job if it involves taking a pay cut? How do you advance your career without overworking yourself? And so much more career advice with Ken Coleman today. And if you want to hear all that, you can listen to this week's Maximal episode available exclusively on Patreon. That's right. You're currently listening to our weekly minimal episode, but each week Ryan and I record an entirely different, much, 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 much longer maximal episode on the Minimalist Private Podcast. Plus, Patreon is the, the best way for us to fund this podcast to keep it 100% advertisement free. When you subscribe to the Minimalist Private Podcast on Patreon, you'll receive a personal link so that our maximal episodes play in your favorite podcast app. You can find all the details and all the good stuff over at theminimalists.com slash support. Ryan, what else you got for us this week? Being informed is more important than ever. So I just want to encourage our readers our, <laughs> our readers and our listeners to read more and get informed. And you can do that by reading Ken Coleman's book, The Proximity Principle. Man, I love how his book just really takes you down the road from uh, from step one to you know step 50 on how to really get going in a career that you really, really love. I think... Uh, he kind of wrote the book I wish we would have written <laughs> about how to help people change their careers. He does a really good job getting you to ask the right questions, which is beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, and I also got some voicemail comments and tips from our listeners. Here, Josh, check them out. Hey, Joshua and Ryan. 
I do find a lot of value in The Minimalist, and I wanted to share with the listeners two apps that I use in regards to clothing. Number one is Rent the Runway. It's an app that you can rent formal dresses and accessories. Um, The cool thing about them is they send you two dresses in two different sizes to ensure that you will find the best fit, and you can see photos of real people wearing the dress to help you decide what will work best for you. It's perfect for weddings or special occasions, um, so you don't have to buy a new item. And number two is Thread Up. It's another app that buys and sells gently used items. They send you a prepaid postage clean-out bag that you can fill up with your unwanted items, and you can get cash for those items or use the credit to purchase a new-to-you item that you would find value in. It's the perfect way to get rid of items that you no longer need and to purchase a gently used new-to-you item. Bonus. You can return items that don't fit or you don't like. I personally try to use it like a storage locker. So you can get rid of the things that you don't want anymore, buy some new-to-you things, and when those things aren't working anymore or you're not finding value in, send them back as well for cash or credit. The only negative thing about Rent the Runway or Thread Up apps is, sorry, Joshua and Ryan, they don't have men's items. But Thread Up does sell children's um, gently used items. So that's a great option for a busy mom like me. Thank you so much, and keep up the good work. Hey, guys. This message is from Steve in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. I have a minimalism tip I would like to share with my fellow listeners. I'm in the process of becoming a minimalist. I am constantly evaluating my possessions and discerning my wants for my needs, as well as questioning the value that certain items bring to me personally. Recently, I was on the verge of selling my beloved custom Gibson ES-335 guitar, a guitar that I truly enjoy and use often. I was convinced that this item needed to go. However, I was still on the fence. I was ready to depart with one of my most prized possessions, but hesitant. The reason I wanted to get rid of this item is because I have another electric guitar that I also use frequently. I use both of both of these guitars often and consider them to be what you all refer to as tools. As I began to clean up the guitar and post an ad on Craigslist, I began to look around at the ridiculous amount of other items that still occupied my home. In that moment, I realized there were an abundance of items that literally brought me zero value and meant much less to me than this guitar. I soon began to truly evaluate my possessions. After taking a few weeks to think more on this particular item, I had I donated and trashed so many other useless objects in the process. If I had written out a list of every item I owned and ranked them in order of importance to me, there would have been hundreds below this particular guitar. I learned a valuable lesson in this process. I was so stuck on the idea of becoming a minimalist and become and getting rid of things that I forgot who I was in the process. Guitars are a big part of my life. So, my fellow minimalists, don't get rid of the things that you know bring you joy. Get rid of all the no-brainers first. Then, if you reach a point where you realize you still do not want that particular item, maybe you will, in fact, still depart from it. But for me, it was all the other crap in my life that I needed to get rid of first. Not one of the few items that I truly love. All right, y'all. Thanks again to Ken Coleman for joining us today. You can check out his podcast, The Ken Coleman Show, his book, The Proximity Principle, and follow him on social media and online, kencoleman.com. And real quick, for right here, right now, here's one thing that's going on in the life of the minimalists. I teach a writing class. It's called How to Write Better. You, If you want to learn how to improve your writing, whether you want to write your first book, your next book, or better tweets or better business emails, if you want to just become a better writer, Learn how to write better at howtowritebetter.org. Much better than my website, howtowritegood.com. <laughs> Gooder. <laughs> Gooder, howtowritegooder.com. <laughs> yeah, howtowritebetter.org. Uh, I teach uh, new students there. Everything, Everyone from like literally medical doctors to high school students, people who have English as a first language or even second language. I've had quite a few students in there. 
uh, from all walks of life. I believe the rising tide lifts all boats. I'll help you develop the, the knowledge, but also the habits to learn how to write better. If you have a question, a comment, or a minimalism tip for our podcast, leave us a voicemail, 406-219-7839, or send a voice memo to podcast at theminimalists.com. You can comment on this episode at youtube.com slash theminimalists. If you want our show notes in your inbox, sign up for our email list over at theminimalists.com. You'll also receive our simple Sunday emails. And for our added value this week, let's listen to a song from Leif Volbeck's new album, now, Bex and I went to go see him uh, live this past uh, this past week in Los Angeles, down at the Moroccan uh, in the Arts District. It was one of the most unique shows I've ever been to. Like he had no opener, which mm. I love because I'm old and I don't want to have to sit through an opener and go home. And it was an early show. <laughs> it was it was a That's 7 like, p.m. show. It's so funny. That is like nine times out of ten if I don't go to a show because I'm like, ah, it's not going to be able to like midnight. <laughs> right. Well, this one, you had to be out of there by uh, 945 oh, because they had. Beautiful. And so he started right on time. He came out. He started playing songs. There was no opener. It was just him by himself playing on piano. But he would. He was joking in a way. We we see a lot of musicians who joke during their set mm-hmm. between songs and stuff. But he would stop mid song and like, man, this kind of reminds me of a a Boy George song, and like just mm. start playing something random. And it was it was such a good show. I really loved his uh, last album. Really enjoyed his last album. It was called Twin Solitude. But this new album he has out right now is called New Ways. So here is a song from that album. Here's Hot Tears from Leif Volbeck's new album, New Ways. And if you leave here today with just one message, we hope it's this. Love people and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. The Minimalists.